So what the heck does math have to do with crochet, knitting, and other crafts? So my last video essay was on crochet and feminism, so in the name of over-intellectualizing things, I want to talk about how math and crafts like crochet are more related than we are traditionally taught to think that they are. So I got this idea because I would consider myself a creative person um, and in school math was my favorite subject um, and while I would consider myself to be creative I do find that I lean towards more creative activities that involve a lot of like problem solving almost like puzzles and the main catalyst for this idea was talking to someone who's quite into drawing and painting who was with me while I was spending time crocheting and they were like, I would never have the patience to do that. And it does require a lot of patience to crochet or knit or embroider or anything like that. But the reason why it requires patience is because yes, of course it takes a long time, but second, because you run into a lot of issues, sometimes basic algebra, sometimes more complicated math, and you have to do a lot of problem solving and that takes a lot of patience and a different way of thinking. That's what made me think, okay, maybe being good at math or at least enjoying math can help you to crochet and be a more proficient crocheter and vice versa. So in my last video essay, I started off with talking about how and why crafts like crochet and knitting first came to be perceived as being feminine or for women. Let's start this with talking about how math came to be perceived as a masculine subject. So in my last video essay, I talked about how the first people to knit were actually men and I couldn't find the opposite thing for math, that women were the first people to do math. But the first modern woman, according to this article, to contribute to the field of mathematics was an Italian named Maria Agnesi. And she was born in 1718 and died in 1799. So in 1748, she published one of the earliest textbooks on calculus. She wasn't the first woman to publish one of the earliest textbooks on calculus, but just one of the earliest textbooks on calculus in general. She was actually recommended by the Pope to be the chair of mathematics in Bologna, um, but she never took up the position because she instead devoted her life to charity. Well, I wouldn't say that mathematics was necessarily formally gendered in the 18th century or earlier than that. There was a French historian of mathematics who said, named Jean-Étienne Montucla, who said that he wished that the Intuzioni Analitiche had been translated into French by a French female mathematician, thus implying he believed there was something intrinsically feminine about the text. There were other women as well in the 18th and early 19th century who contributed to mathematics, such as Emilie du Châtelet, Mary Somerville, and Ada Lovelace, who, if you're interested in computer science, you probably already know about. And something that they had in common was that they actually weren't deterred from entering the field of mathematics or pursuing math as a subject. If anything, they were all encouraged because in the social circles that they were a part of, which were upper class circles, enlightenment was for everyone. However, that doesn't mean that they weren't held back at all. They couldn't hold any official positions. The first woman mathematician to be admitted as a fellow of the Royal Society was Mary Cartwright in 1947. So that's quite late considering that Maria Agnesi published that book on calculus in 1749, like 200 years earlier. So their barriers to being, I guess, respected in math were less about their ability as mathematicians and more about the lack of respect for women's ability to lead in general. So not necessarily saying women can't do math, but just saying women can't hold high positions in anything. So if we're talking about why mathematics came to be perceived as masculine in general, um, this largely comes from the fact that women were denied these positions and this would continue with women being denied in general access to equal education. So clearly, in my opinion, the social norm of math as a masculine concept is similar to saying that crochet is a feminine concept. Both of these norms are imagined, but they do stem from real prejudices faced by women throughout history. So then these social norms based off of real experiences and prejudices influence our perception 
and force us to subconsciously separate practices like knitting and crochet and math and physics into different genders. But let's now get into how exactly crochet and knitting, etc., are mathematical. So why does it even matter that we gender these different areas of activity or learning? Well, because knitting and crochet and other handiwork can actually help anyone, but especially young girls, to improve their skills and understanding of mathematics and similar subjects. This is from an article from NBC, which wrote that the math of handicraft was long dismissed as merely a cute trick or an inconsequential coincidence. Which is funny because this article also says that the partnership between math and crafts dates back to the invention of geometry. So you see repetitive patterns in ancient baskets and weavings, which hinted at a mathematical subtext to the world at large. And this continued on even with male mathematicians, computer scientists like Alan Turing, who was often seen knitting Mobius strips and other geometric shapes during his lunch breaks. But a modern interest in the connection between crochet and math being formally studied didn't come until the late 90s, really, when Dana Taimina, hopefully I'm pronouncing that right, of Cornell decided to crochet a hyperbolic plane, which is a curvature that is seen all the time in nature. And while the hyperbolic plane is a very common curvature that had been studied at this point, this was actually the first time that there was a good physical model of the curvature. It's a shape that's difficult to model with paper and plastic, and with the increases that you do in crochet and knitting, it's actually fairly simple and more tactile. So as you can guess, since this was the first good physical model, she gained a lot of notoriety and the interest between crafts and math also gained some interest. This led to other researchers modeling with crafts other complex shapes such as the Lorenz manifold. The Lorenz manifold shows how objects move through chaotic spaces such as a flowing river or an atmosphere. So Hinka Osinga, another person whose name I don't know if I'm pronouncing correctly, from the University of Bristol made her crochet model of the Lorenz manifold and this was the first physical model that you had of this shape. So through this research, these mathematicians find themselves going back to the original motive behind studying geometry, looking at and analyzing the structure of everyday objects, whether they were in nature or a basket that was woven by someone. But blending math with different crafts isn't just for people who are making groundbreaking models. I found some profiles and work by these two British math teachers who were actually a couple and they started using knits, specifically afghans that they would knit, to teach and represent mathematical concepts to their students in the late 90s. This is a picture of the couple. They were very adorable. And according to this profile of them in The Guardian, they, at that time, as of 2016, had spent around 9,000 hours knitting their math gans, as they call them. And they ended up buying a four-story Victorian home in order to be able to hang all of their math gans on the walls. This is also from the article. We always tried to make sure that knitting was not seen as a female Activity. And she also said that Steve, who is the husband, because they were husband and wife, always knits at any event to emphasize this point. She also said in this interview, we find more reluctance from women who say they can't do maths than from men who say they can't knit. And I found this quote quite interesting because it reinforces what we know about why young boys are more likely to pursue math than young girls in school, which is simply because they believe that they can. That being said, here's a little tangent on why men are more likely to pursue math than women are. Shelley Carell, who is a professor of sociology at Stanford, said, boys do not pursue mathematical activities at a higher rate than girls because they are better at mathematics. They do so, at least in part, because they think they are better. So this isn't just an ego thing, but it also comes from social norms that we are taught from a young age. And in other words, any justification that someone might provide for gendering math, such as saying there's more men in higher fields of mathematics than women, isn't based on actual genetic evidence, but rather on what becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy for many. But back to these math gans, they're absolutely stunning. Let's take a look. Click, 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 click. Pat said that this project basically took over their life as a couple. Um, and so that the best part was influencing the lives of many, most often women, 
mathphobics who would not dream of becoming involved with anything mathematical in other circumstances. So for many women that they encountered, this was their first time feeling confident in a mathematical sphere, I guess. So unfortunately, I went on her Twitter and I saw that Pat actually passed away in 2021 and was survived by her husband, Steve. But I haven't found much activity from Steve himself online since her death. But he seems to also have a particular interest in illusion knitting, which is really, really cool. And I'll put some pictures here. So, so far, I've only really talked about anecdotal evidence of knitting benefiting math and vice versa. But there has been some research on the topic in the last 10 years. One prominent researcher is Melissa Grisalfi. She is an associate professor of math education at Vanderbilt. So she runs the Knit Lab project, which teaches kids to knit after school, but also allows her to do some research on their problem solving. So it's actually really cute, but in the Knit Lab, the children wear GoPros around their necks in order to show their problem solving in real time. And then Grisalfi and her research assistants go through hours of footage and analyze it. In research, they found that once kids master the logistics of basic knitting, they can quickly move on to the more complex skills of problem solving and designing. And again, this connection between math and crafts goes beyond just basic algebra, but it also is able to illustrate three-dimensional math concepts that are often left to college-level abstract thinking. The physicist Richard Feynman once recalled overhearing two college women discussing the properties of analytic geometry, only to discover that one was showing the other how to knit argyle socks. And it's possible that these women didn't realize that they were talking about mathematics, although I don't want to disregard the possibility that they were aware of that. But Griselfi herself also hinted at this sort of coincidental subconscious mathematical thinking, saying that People don't see it. Crafters themselves, so people who actively knit, crochet, whatever, don't often see that math is what they're doing. But what we want to know in her study is this. What is it about textile crafting that sustains deep, committed participation? So in order to be a fiber artist, which is what I think she means by this, you have to be very like committed to the project you're working on because it does take a lot of time, takes a lot of problem solving, as I said earlier. She also wanted to know, are they the same qualities that could sustain rich mathematical thinking? So this article that I was reading was from a while ago, but the research paper, one of the research papers that came out of the Knit Lab, came out in April 2017 called Recrafting Manipulatives Toward a Critical Analysis of Gender and Mathematical Practice. So she wrote, overall, our findings suggest that knitting can be a useful resource for pushing on or supporting mathematical reasoning, but as with all manipulatives, so I had to look up what manipulatives are, but in the field of education, which she's a math education professor, manipulatives are materials or any like object, physical object that allows students to explore an idea. So think like building blocks, um, spinners or paper, things like that. So she wrote, as with all manipulatives, whether or not that occurs, so whether or not the manipulative being a useful resource occurs is related to what the students already know and understand and their facility with the use of the manipulatives themselves. So while that sounds a bit discouraging or not very like, a, or it doesn't sound like a very concrete connection between crafting and maths, we also have this bit from the conclusion of that same paper. What is conspicuously absent from all classrooms is a form of manipulative, so something like a building block, something that kids can touch, that can be moved and shaped in multiple ways. Malleable materials such as textiles. And when considering the gendered histories of these materials, the conspicuous absence of this class of manipulatives, those traditionally associated with women's craft, seems more troubling. So by that she means that classrooms don't have yarn and potentially because yarn is a very gendered material and maybe isn't seen as something that's suitable for all children. She goes on, there's a question of whether and why we should choose not to include manipulatives whose use can span multiple grade levels. Few manipulatives allow for the exploration of such an array of mathematical ideas as is afforded by textile work. So in other words, stacking blocks can only model probably up to basic algebra, whereas doing something like knitting can 
model as we know a Lorenz manifold or a hy hyperbolic sphere. So beyond this, let's look at how graphs kind of relate to computer science as well. In an interview with the education publication KQED, Karen Shoup, who is an electrical engineering professor at Queen Mary University in London, explained that knitting instructions are largely binary. So in computer science, you have zeros and ones. And in knitting, you pretty much just have knit and purl. She says, most interesting are the knitting instructions, which read just like regular expressions of code used for string matching and manipulation when coding. She also wrote an essay for this website that I thought was funny called computerscienceforfun.org, where she describes how an undergraduate student, I'm assuming her own student, at Queen Mary used her computer science and knitting knowledge to code an application that would allow users to input their number of knits and pearls for a pattern to actually like model what the pattern would physically look like once done. And research in general has shown that knitting can improve computational thinking and the fact that there is an ease of translation between written knitting patterns and actual code for computers is encouraging. So let's go back to what this all means for women specifically. So while most of the people who are also mostly women doing research in this field are interested in the way crafts and maths can benefit our learning and problem solving abilities. It's no secret that some of them are also seeking to prove a point, which is that math isn't just for boys, knit slash crochet isn't just for girls, and that knitting and crocheting deserves credit beyond just being like a fun art to do at home. However, part of the reason why maybe this field of research hasn't gone that far is because this perception of the male math brain might be a more uniquely U.S. American concept. So this same article that I cited earlier from University of Massachusetts, Lowell, Lowell wrote that Taimina, who was the mathematician who first crocheted the hyperbolic sphere, that she was raised in Latvia where a handiwork so skills like knitting and crocheting are actually taught in schools. And for her, the idea that there has to be a separation between math and crafts is unnecessary and even silly. The article wrote, she sees mathematics sexism problem to be a uniquely American one. Attending university in Latvia, Taimina said no one considered math and science to be male domains. The Atlantic's article from 2013 titled The Myth of I'm Bad at Math also discusses this. So this article compares U.S. American attitudes towards education to that of attitudes in Japan, Korea, and China. In the U.S., this article says, and I would agree with, intelligence is seen as something that is inborn. It's considered to be an inborn talent. Whereas in these other countries, the focus in schools and on where intelligence comes from is hard work and discipline. So because intelligence in the U.S. is seen as an inborn talent, that allows us to more easily gender these different subjects. So we can say that men are born this way, being good at and interested in math, and women are born this way, being interested in art and just naturally good at it. So for all the knitters, crocheters, crafters who watch this video, I want to know, do you hate math or were you good at it in school? And have you ever thought about the connection between the two? I know some people really avoid like looking at written patterns because they are too sort of analytical and maybe even mathematical, but chances are if you're a more like advanced crocheter, you kind of end up having to look at patterns and through that you probably maybe have gotten better at math without even realizing it. And I think this still applies if you mostly do like freehand crochet and knit because you have to understand how shapes are formed and what steps you need to take in order to make these shapes, which is very much computational thinking. So let me know what you think about this subject in the comments and subscribe for more. My TikTok is Carla Calling and watch my last video essay on crochet and feminism if you haven't already. I'll be back with plenty of video essays, vlogs, and crochet content, of course. So see you next time.